Hey everyone, um, I'm Myra Kwaja, Director of Public Strategy at the Invisible Institute. And I first wanna say thank you guys so much for having me if you're watching. I, um, like six or seven years ago, I used to be a regular at Shy Hack Night um, when I was a civic tech fellow at Microsoft. And it was such an important, it continues to be a really important community in Chicago, but it's the place where I learned how to use the open data portal, for the city, um, making maps, map box. Um, yeah, and I'm just very grateful because it taught me how to be a better journalist and, and just engaged person in Chicago. So I'm so impressed that it's still going and honored to be speaking here. Um, I also wanted to follow up on Lori's uh, mention of the Adam Toledo video and the Chauvin trial. Um, this is a particularly stressful time in Chicago and I hope if you are here, you realize that we, we're not going to look at images of torture, but the history is very heavy. And um, if anything, it, it shows the ways that this project of the Chicago Police Torture Archive is, is very relevant in living history. And uh, there are ongoing cases still today of torture survivors who are um, incarcerated and, and fighting for their, for their release, for their freedom. So um, today we'll be particularly focused on how we can build civic tech tools, or in this case, like journalism tools that are not just accountable to the people that the data is about or the story is about, but actually useful to the people um, mentioned, um, mentioned in the data. Um, so when we're thinking about who are we creating something for, who did we curate this archive for? There are many users. I'm sure there are UX people watching. Um, but something that I think about a lot and my colleagues at the Invisible Institute is um, it's one thing to make data playful and fun and, and accessible, um, right? Not just a spreadsheet, but also can it be useful in terms of like um, driving impact or driving um, people's search for justice? So um, for some background, for those who are not familiar with the Invisible Institute or the Chicago Police Torture Archive, I'm going to share my screen and walk you through some of the, the stages of our work. Um, all right, I hope that you can see this. Yes, you can. Um, so the Invisible Institute is a journalism organization on the South Side um, based in the Experimental Station. And we're one of many um, nonprofit organizations in the ecosystem of like Chicago justice reporting. Um, we frequently collaborate with City Bureau who does a great job making civic tech tools. Uh, we collaborate with the Southside Weekly, an incredible local newspaper. Um, one of the things I think that we're best known for in addition to reporting on cases like Harith Augustus and Laquan McDonald is we are well known for the Citizens Police Data Project. So, uh, the Citizens Police Data Project, in many ways, was our first, our first project of our, of using archival information um, from the city. So we would, through the Freedom of Information Act request, we would um, end litigation, FOIA litigation. We would extract data that pu publicly like does belong to us, but is not accessible, and we would make uh, misconduct records accessible and useful. Um, and one of the ways that we, we make it useful is um, thinking about when people actually need to look at misconduct information. So one of, the, one of the moments that always occurs to me is when somebody has a case, has a court case and they look at their paperwork for their arresting officers um, and they're gonna speak with a public defender or any attorney. And it is really helpful to, to know or provide that information to your attorney um, what are the what is the misconduct history, um, the allegations made against those officers, um, and so part of the reason why uh, the team behind CPDP um, prioritized the search bar was to make it easier because a lot of people don't know the you know the badge number, which is not a constant thing, um, or they might not know the name of like a CR, a complaint record. So building a building a search was very challenging, but really important to prioritize. Um, so similarly, we, we do think of this in some ways that we don't talk about it publicly often as an archive. Um, this is a collection of almost a quarter of a million 
stories, right, of people's testimonies that they made to the government about, um, about harm that they experienced. And so in a way, it's like, how do we, how do we not just think about archive projects? Um, how can we use civic tech to think about um, archives as like an actively useful thing, even though these are historic, historical complaints that happened in the past, it's not an ongoing, um, it's not an ongoing case. Um, so that takes us to, this was our precedent. And this was the, the reason why we started to think of ourselves as like, okay, we, we might be able to uh, take on more than just police misconduct records. So in 2017, um, in 2017, the uh, Posen Center for Human Rights at the University of Chicago approached us saying, we have um, case files, just like a ton of case files donated to us from the People's Law Office. If you're not familiar with um, the Burge torture cases, um, the Burge torture cases were, um, were basically from the late 70s through the 80s to the early 90s um, of detectives under the command of John, of John Burge, who at Area 2 and Area 3, those are police districts, um, tortured upwards of 100 black men, black people, um, majority of the, majority of the uh, survivors are, are men. Um, and they were frequently um, arrested and tortured into confession because, um, because uh, police were pressured to, to find somebody that committed a crime. So many of these men pictured here were teenagers, were young adults, were children, in fact. Um, one was the same age as Adam Toledo, um, who, were, who were forced into confession and spent years, decades of their lives in prison. Um, and some are still incarcerated, um, working towards their freedom. Um, but the Burge torture cases um, are well known in Chicago and um, for those who are brand new to this, in 2015, um, a historic reparations ordinance was passed in the city of Chicago that created a, a fund, $5.5 million, spread across like 50 something, 57, I think, um, survivors, plus um, required curriculum in Chicago public schools, plus a torture justice center, which provides um, holistic support for survivors, um, and a commitment that is still unfulfilled by the city to fund a permanent memorial in the city of Chicago. I, I ground this because this sounds like very depressing history, but I actually think it is incredibly inspirational because we have not seen otherwise, I think, um, what collective reparations for black people um, who have suffered at the hands of police and the state. Um, I think this is one of like the sharpest examples that this is what collective reparations could look like. So I just want us to, to think about how we can learn from these cases, not only as a, wow, I can't believe this horrible thing has happened and is happening in Chicago, but also what can we learn from the organizing effort that took attorneys, organizers, teachers, mothers, um, engaged people like us and like you watching, um, all working together across sectors to push for this reparations package um, after a, a four decade struggle. So coming back to this archive, um, the, the People's Law Office, which represented many of the survivors and continues to represent survivors, um, had, a, had just boxes of case files. Um, Flint Taylor, who is well known as the, the first attorney or one of the first attorneys to represent survivor there, um, donated his files to the Posen Center. And the University of Chicago did not want um, to put these files in special collections. I feel fine about calling them out. Um, but they asked us, the Invisible Institute, because of our work with CPDP, if we could curate and make these files engaging and accessible. Um, this conversation began in 2017 and it, the archive has just come out this past February, 2021. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about our process. So that first summer of 2017, we had many interns um, and we mostly worked on, a big part of what we worked on was going through every single document and, um, and classifying them in Airtable about what 
what everything was, court transcripts, depositions, newspaper clips, affidavits, et cetera. You can see kind of how we organized it here. A timeline, people, um, this is, you know, maybe this is a plug for Airtable, but the Invisible Institute really loves and relies on this tool. Um, that, is, that is free until you get to like 50,000 records. Um, then we got to this point where we were like, okay, well, we've created this monster of an air table and we've created this Dropbox folder. Um, and, you know, we can start making this accessible to, with the table of contents, we can start making this accessible to students um, and people doing research on the Burge cases, but this is not accessible. This is kind of intimidating. Nobody really, it's just a lot of legal documents. Um, and this is where our role as journalists came in. Um, we think the best way that people can understand documents and, and narratives within government records is stories. So we then began the like two to three year process of gathering profiles, um, working with reporters to, to write profiles of survivors. Now we know for sure that there are more than 57 survivors probably around 150, I'm sure more than that actually. Um, and so right now we, we, only have, we only have this many on our site, right? So this is a work in progress. Um, but what we, what we knew was important for when we did release this to the public finally in February, 2021 was that every story would also be tied to the relevant documents in the, in the Dropbox folder. Um, and we think it can be a really important educational tool, but we also think coming back to this idea of how can it be useful um, for people who, who need this information in a critical immediate way, um, it is useful to peers of the survivors who have gotten out. Um, it is useful for people who are still trying to fight their cases and make claims that this detective that uh, you know, forced me into false confession I now have evidence that this officer was named in, in Anthony Holmes case um, or in fill in the blank survivors um, case. So it was really important to us that we make, we make it accessible, not for attorneys, right? But also for families of, of survivors um, who are still pushing for their loved one's freedom because uh, oftentimes families, and especially in these cases of the bird survivors, it was really mothers and families that insisted that these cases not be forgotten about, that it not just be limited to the one-time trial, but that they would work with other families, they would work with other mothers and other organizers. So making it really, truly publicly understandable um, beyond legal documents was, was very important. Um, some other things about the archive, and I, I decided not to go like deep into the, the history of the, um, arc, of the torture cases, but if you have questions, you're welcome to ask. I wanted to more, because this is Hack Night, sort of show you what we were thinking about from a, from a design perspective. Um, we, I think one of the biggest things we thought about was what are the, there are many different users of this site. Um, I think what's particularly unique about um, what's particularly unique about this case, and that's a very inspirational example, is we knew our audience was attorneys, teachers, students, mothers, families, survivors themselves, journalists, researchers, and thinking about the language and also thinking about just, just like who are you, which audience are you prioritizing? This is the thing that we have with both CPDP and with this archive. We don't necessarily want to be prioritizing just one audience, right? I think this would have been designed, for, if it was only for attorneys, we probably could have left it maybe as the air table. Um, but I think something that is important is that we were thinking a lot about um, the difficulties of implementing reparations package. The, we do know that, you know, there's the curriculum was introduced in, in 2017, but many teachers struggle to fit it into their to their schedule, many schools have mixed results with teaching it. And so we knew that if we could, if we could build a site that could be seen as a unif like a, a point where people can understand this whole ecosystem, understand all the resources out there related to the Burge cases, um, this could be a landing spot for, for anyone from those various groups um, who are trying to teach or understand 
how this how this uh, reparations package was achieved. Um, we relied a lot on people's generosity, like um, Joey Mogul, who is an attorney at um, at People's Law Office, but a, a maybe more importantly, an organizer and a co-founder of the Church of Justice Memorials. Um, she donated a lot of her writing on the legal history and of the movement history. Um, we relied a lot on photographers across across the decades to donate their photos um, on families to to share their stories. We continue to hear from them, um, and and I think it really does it does show like most of the most of the materials we have on here are not from the city. They're not, you know, from an open data portal. We were creating something that we felt, how, why hasn't this already been created? It's been created in, in scattered ways as best as people could from their perspectives. Um, but we were able to sort of act as a, as a facilitator or mediator between these many different ways of knowing about the torture cases. Um, so I think I will, I will wrap up and I really do want you to encourage you to, to read this history if you don't know it, spend some time with it. Um, it is incredible and um, heart-wrenching, but also inspiring um, just to think about what it takes to achieve justice and how and when it's possible. I think right now that's a really relevant question. Um, the last thing I'll say is just a lesson from what I've learned over the past five years working on this and working on working with the Invisible Institute. Um, when we first took on this project in 2017, I remember thinking to myself like, oh, this represents the, the worst of Chicago history, like the worst of Chicago police history. And over my time at the Invisible Institute, I have learned that that is a, that is a common misconception about, um, about state violence when people learn about it, when people see the George Floyd, the video of George Floyd being murdered or Adam Toledo or Laquan McDonald, et cetera. We think we know about these things because they are so horrible that they had to come to light. Um, and something I've learned that I remember Jamie Calvin told me this, but I've now seen it myself as well. That's not why we find out things that we don't know the worst that there is. Um, we actually, know about these things because there are enough people from varying perspectives who at the right time and in the right place were committed to bringing it to light or seeking justice. And so this is a, this is a perfect example, I think, of, of people being willing to embrace the spirit of collaboration that, that we see in the civic tech community often um, and just sort of the ongoing commitment. And I think we also see it in in the George Floyd case of there were enough people from different perspectives um, from like an EMT, um, you know, people with not just with phones, but um, from varying perspectives that could um, and organizers who were so, super committed um, to staying on top of that incident. Um, and it's important to remember that there's there's many awful things that we don't know, but um, a lot of our work, not just ours, but I mean our like people who are watching a part of a part of the shy hack night community um, part of the commitment to make information visible and accessible and useful is a critical one um, to to making sure that people understand um, systemic problems and not just not just the worst of what's happened but um, but emblematic examples of what goes on um, so thank you all for joining I would love any questions you have about the website or about the Invisible Institute or about this history in general. Um, I'm really grateful for you all taking the time to watch. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, we do have some questions. I will go ahead and read the first one. Um, one question um, about the Invisible Institute um, and the Citizens Police Data Project. Um, the question was, can you comment on um, Mayor Lightfoot's comments uh, recently pushing back against the Inspector General's office building a public online database of police officer misconduct cases? Um, so for folks who may not be familiar, there, there was an ordinance proposed to, um, to have kind of, I guess, a, the office of the Inspector General maintain a database 
which might be somewhat similar to what's in the citizens police database project. So. I am so glad you asked. Yes, we support this ordinance. Um, we are super pro operationalizing transparency. Um, and I believe Jamie, Jamie Calvin spoke at the, um, at the hearing last Friday. Um, yes, please contact your alderman and encourage them to support this ordinance. It is super simple. It is a softball um, for the city. Um, it's also just common sense. Um, I think, you know, it's CPDP does a lot to make things accessible and useful, but the, the Office of the Inspector General should perform this function and should be allowed to perform this function. And her comments about it being expensive are not founded um, in, in any sort of real financial analysis. I believe, it would be a few million dollars over the course of five years. It is not asking for anything unreasonable for the city and it's a drop in the bucket compared to the police budget. So thank you for asking. Okay. Next question is how have data analysts and scientists made use of this data? Do you have a vision for that? Yeah, great question. So yeah, we um, frequently receive um, requests from people in academia, our data scientists, um, we make our, our information accessible and downloadable on GitHub, but we also have from the past two years, this is like an ongoing process, um, updating CPDP to include, um, for those who are maybe a little bit more familiar, the clear database um, and their other CMS because C uh, CPD and COPA changed their, um, their data systems we're working to update um, those. And so sometimes when researchers reach out, we can provide them more, um, more personalized help with understanding the data outside of also what's on CPDP. Um, so yeah, we, provided, we provide guidance often on FOIAs. Um, I've, seen, I've seen many researchers use our data. Um, one researcher whose work I love is Bokar Ba, um, and I encourage you to look up his work but yeah, I, I'm happy to be more specific than that or send examples or links, but we love when researchers wanna use our work. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, one, another question, um, uh, this person is curious what kind of engagement you've seen on the website, how many people engage and to what extent? Great question. Um, it comes and goes. Um, Right now it's intense, like on a day, like when, um, when the Adam Toledo video came out, I know we received well over 2000 hits on Eric Stillman's record specifically. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I should have brought up my anal the analytics dashboard before this presentation, but, um, but yeah, I think it, it definitely changes depending on media attention on police cases. So there's definitely times where it's lower, but, um, but I think what is important to, is to see like how frequently we get messages or questions from intercom. A lot of people from outside of Chicago asking about, I'm like at least once or twice a week of people asking like, does this exist in this city in Texas or why can't it, or what would, what would it take? And so, um, so we definitely have a steady stream of in and out of Chicago audience. What do you think uh, maintenance and ongoing curation of the archive will look like? Um, wait, sorry, I wanted to back up. Was the sure. question previously about CPDP or about the torture archive? Maybe both. Right? Okay, my bad. Yeah. I was still in CPDP mode um, for both, like all of the questions that you guys asked. Um, but researchers have been, to, to back up a little bit, researchers have been using the Chicago Police Torture Archive since 2017 um, when, we, when we put it out on Dropbox. But just as like, we, we had a page on our website that was like, if you want this, let us know, we'll send this to you. Where I think the link was public. And so, yeah, we, we definitely see researchers referring to it. Um, and yeah, I, it's been a lot of attention since it first came out, which is great. I'm curious to see over the next few months what it looks like. Um, I think the school year helps bring a lot of attention to it. Um, 
what is our plan for going forward? Um, there's a lot of plans, um, specifically just, I was referencing how many survivors there are and there's many more profiles to write. And there's um, a lot of ephemera um, that families have collected from their, from protests or from cases. And so I think interviewing family members and gathering other, like other, other things to put into the archive is the major thing. I think we'd also like to further build out um, what it looks like to go into the officer misconduct history of the officers and detectives involved um, involved in the cases. So, so yes, more police data tie-ins. Um, another question, um, are, are there any national public interest data or journalism projects focused on police misconduct that we should also check out? So I guess other related or uh, projects that you can think of. Yeah, good question. Um, I feel like there's so many online <laughs> that it's hard to know exactly what how to narrow it down. Um, I've been following um, Rahim as like an interesting experiment that's based out of the Bay Area. And I think it's like civilian um, police complaints made to an independent citizen led organization, not a government agency. And I am really curious to see what impact that is able to have in the court of law. Um, so that's, that's just, that's something I'm interested in and I'm paying attention to. Um, I think otherwise I have turned a lot of my attention to thinking, to looking at like um, people who are on the ground working with those who have faced police abuse. So um, I've been working, I've been looking a lot at like the Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis um, here in Chicago. I've been following along with what the defund campaign is doing and what acre campaigns is doing there they just launched a or they're currently launching a campaign on like surveillance technology um they're really focused on canceling the shot spotter contract and so i think um some of the campaigns that are working together around 21st century policing and what what surveillance and e-carceration will look like i think um that's very valuable so yes follow acre campaigns um they have some good research. Have you been surprised uh, by how anyone has used either the CPDP or the archive project? Um, have I been surprised? I think I was, I was surprised, not surprised, but I think one of the memorable things of the past year was seeing at some pro like videos online or seeing at protests, people reading misconduct data back to the officers themselves. Um, and that I think was, a, was reassuring in some way that like, okay, the mobile tool is meaningful because I, I do know that like sometimes it, it's a lot, it's a lot of data in here. And so to, to see, see people find it useful in real time and find it find it gratifying in some way, like, good, I have this, like, this information is a, is a tool of my power against this person. Like, I think that says a lot. And so um, I think I was a little bit surprised by that, but in a really good way. Um, the next question about collective reparations. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the climate of collective reparations, given that the city doesn't seem too keen on making data like this more readily available? What sort of political or social climate do you think, uh, do you see for that to be a reality in Chicago? Um, Good question. Um, I'm hopeful that the city will um, be forced to change its mind on the like the OIG thing. I don't think that you know making information accessible is reparations, um, but I do think um, I do think with collective reparations, what we saw is um, just an insistence. Like the, the the call for reparations rose to like the UN level. Like the We Charge Genocide group testified in front of the UN, um, but I think. 
I think, you know, what it, the cl climate has always kind of been really difficult at the Chicago city government level. Um, but I think what it takes is if there are enough people in Chicago that are so insistent on something across the city um, and make a national, a national like, you know, press thing of it, um, I think it is possible to, to push for, for collective reparations. Um, and we just have to do a lot more thinking about what that looks like. Um, because right now, the way that this, the government is set up is that the closest we get to it, and it's not reparations, is settlements for police complaints or for police misconduct cases. Um, settle, settling for misconduct, pretty soon we'll be adding settlement data to the Citizens Police Data Project, which would be great. Um, but I think what we see now is just payouts for, for people who've, who you know, have suffered um, and that's not enough. That's not, that's basically paying people to, you know, not pursue their cases. Um, so I think it would take a reckoning with what settlements look like, and it would take a pretty sustained coordinated effort with a lot of support from the city. I mean, the city's people to force the city to, to create collective reparations. Uh, can you share the process, uh, a little different, main the process for building um, the design of the website, although it doesn't specify, I'll assume the tor torture archive, building the design around the audience. Um, how did they translate their audi audience ideas into design decisions? And then can you provide some guidance for how to do that? Yeah. So I'm not the UX designer on the team. Um, the director of design was Sakari Stone. Um, but so user research design is really important. And I think what's really important at the outset of the project is to think about who are the, who are the people you're building it for? And there could be a few different, like it's helpful to have a few people in specific people in mind too. So for, for me, for example, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about like mothers of the police torture survivors um, or like family members. I was thinking about students, like high school students that I had worked with, could they use this in their papers? Um, I was thinking about, um, you know, me when I was a student and needing a historical timeline. Um, and then I think something that really helps is sitting down over the course of these years, having like focus groups or having one-on-one -on -one interviews um, with the survivors, which we did, with organizers, which we did. And then um, some really helpful people were attorneys who were able to come to us and say, you know, you have a lot of writing and you have a lot of documents, but what we also really want is like, we find CPVP really useful. Can you make the officer information from all these documents really accessible so that an attorney could easily be like, oh, this officer is named in this archive. Um, that will help me with my case. Um, and so after some feedback, so for one example, um, we got feedback in, in 2020 about you know not having enough of the police data approach in this archive. And so I'll just share my screen quickly again. Um, and from that, we decided to um, build in a part of CPDP into the site. So if you go to resources and then police data, we were like, okay, attorneys are gonna want sometimes to go straight to the police data stuff. So we're able to say, okay, we know for sure we have these 53 Chicago police officers named in our archive who are also on CPDP. So what we can do is build a, a pin board on CPDP. We already have this tool in CPDP. We can build a pin board that allows you to see, oh wait, I don't know what just happened. Sorry. Um, oh no. Well, basically what's supposed to happen is that you are, oh, this is the pin board, my bad. Um, you're able to just look at the whole like crew of officers who are named um, as you like click through the officers that we have. You can see this is what we currently have for them in our in CPDP. And something about this that was surprising and useful to me was that, you know, officers named in here don't necessarily have um, police misconduct records on their 
background, in part because the police complaint process has not always been accessible. Um, and, and so you can't just assume that like an officer who doesn't have anything on his record is like clear in the clear. It could just be because it was not easy to make police complaints. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's basically one of the design decisions that we took a pretty big turn because we were like, oh, lawyers really want us, want to be able to make use of the data and not just the stories. So, so yeah, this is what the pin board was, looks like that I was referring to. Um, so yeah, I think knowing who you're designing for and interviewing them about, you know, what kind of information they find useful, things like that. Uh, the next question, actually, I think it's a good, good follow on for that. Um, can you explain a bit more about the roles that other officers played in what Burge orchestrated? Were assistant state's attorneys, public defenders, or judges involved in covering up the torture? Yeah, it sounds like the person asking the question knows the answer to it, which is that um, John Burge himself did not uh, torture all of the people named, right? He was in charge of all of them and also directed them with techniques. Um, he had a lot of associates and it's really, when we say Burge torture, we're, we're talking about torture in a pe time period of officers working together in area two and in area three. Um, I think a lot of people know more know the stories of area two. Um, and so, um, really violent torture techniques, um, sexual violence, um, like shocking people by the testicles, um, you know, not allowing people to eat, um, really, really horrible things that go beyond just what John Burge himself did, um, but he was directly responsible for and directed. Um, and then on top of that, to the, to the questions point, um, the DA like repeatedly, repeatedly people in the prosecutor's office were, were given information that they ignored or denied, um, judges as well. And so it, for many, many years did seem like, um, you know, it, there's a, there's a, in one of the first stories that a lot of people do know, um, a doctor at Cook County Jail, like in the hospital there, Stroger, saw this, saw uh, signs of torture and reported it to higher ups and reported it to um, the DA and was just like shut down. So it was it was a lot more than just the, the people who literally carried out the acts of torture. Um, across the city, there was just um, refusal to, to pay attention to it because it would be inconvenient. And I'm really glad you asked this question because a lot the reason that a lot of these men who were at the time very young men or boys when they were arrested, they were uh, frequently arrested, like I said, because they needed to find, the police had to find someone and the prosecutor, the DA like needed to arrest someone for a crime. And so it would be a problem to be like, well, we settled this case, we arrested the, we arrested the guy. Um, and I feel like it's relevant to bring back up like towards the end of this event too, is that um, in the case of Adam Toledo, a thing that I'm really worried about is like the, the 21 year old that was with him Regardless of your opinion of what you think should happen to that 21 year old, it is a problem that he has become a political scapegoat for the mayor and for others to be like, this is the guy who put him in danger, not the police. That's what the, the mayor is saying. So to say, we're gonna charge him with child endangerment, we're gonna do everything. This, this idea that we're like, we're gonna make a point or we're gonna like carry out this lesson and be tough on this young guy, this young kid, whatever, when like the, he's not the kid that he's not the person that killed Adam Toledo, so for him to get a harsher punishment than Eric Stillman is it's just something to think about because this that's the same thinking the political scapegoat thinking that led to many of these men being arrested, tortured, and locked up for for decades. Uh, can you say more about uh, making complicated legal information accessible, especially for audiences like teachers and students? Yeah, so I think the, the best way to do that is like um, focusing on the narrative of the person who experienced the harm and allowing that story to be told 
explains a lot because what you can do then, if you can understand and just listen to that story, whether it be in the written journalism context or video interview or whatever, is then you can afterwards draw lines from like, okay, this legal document that is like a complaint record or a case file, this is referring to this thing. This person is the complainant. This person is the victim. There could be a difference between the complainant and the victim. And so I think it's tough, but what's what's the best way to do it, I think, is rather than take a document and highlight things and try to point things out, I think that can sometimes be intimidating. I think centering the human story and then being like, this human story is in this part of the document. This human's like, that's that's how I usually do it if I'm talking with young people. Um, another somewhat related question. Is there anything that you learned through building the archive that you'd want to share with other journalists or people building transparency related sites? Um, something that I've learned that I'm still learning is I think there is this like, there's this feeling or belief that you will get to a finish line that like you will finish the project and you won't finish the project. <laughs> like you you have to decide where your like different points of publication are and do as well do. Cause like I said, we started in 2017 and 2021 we released it and there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, and so I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for but for me, it just felt like if you're taking on a big public information project you have to, you get to create the moments where you like drive publicity around something. It's all very manufactured. So um, even with CPDP, I feel like we, we put new things on it, but we don't make like a big thing of it often. And I think that's something we think about a lot is like, when do we, when do we be like, we did it. It's like the work is never done. So you kind of have to design that stuff, those moments. So can you speak to the landscape in Chicago? Uh, it feels like we are lucky to have a lot of uh, great journalism in people focused on justice and transparency questions. Like, like explain what the landscape looks like? Uh, I think it sounds like you, it, this person is saying that it's kind of, it, it could be unusual that we have so many people interested in like um, transparency about these issues and just a lot of people in journalism interested in it. Yeah, yeah, um, no, Chicago is amazing for, in part for that reason. Um, I, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll describe some of them. So in journalism, and this is like separate from Shai Hacknight, because I think like if you go into the, the prod, like M Relief, who you'll be hearing from in a few weeks, like also emerge from a very similar scene, right? And there's a there's a lot of overlap between like the civic tech world and the journalism world in Chicago and, and the organizing world, which I think is awesome. Um, so on the journalism side, there's Injustice Watch, there's City Bureau, there's Southside Weekly, there's, um, now I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna forget some. There's Ergo Radio. Um, and it, I think that in the Chicago Reader, the Chicago Independent Media Alliance is a really great, list of organizations, the tribe, um, a great list of organizations who are really thinking about the people that they are um, reporting about and for and, and sometimes by. Um, and I think that there's a really close proximity there to, to organizations like Emerly for organizations like, like the Documenters Program and City Bureau is a great civic tech tool um, that performs a journalism function, right? Um, I think on the organizing side, um, there is a landscape of like some of the bigger organizations like United Working Families, um, Grassroots Collaborative, R3. I think in Chicago, something that's good to know is that like we rely a lot on campaigns, like issue based campaigns to do a lot of the work of bringing people into the organizing world. So, and that goes so that you'll work with organizers who are involved in STOP and UWF and, you know, whatever. Um, and they're in, involved in many things, but they work together on something like the defund CPD campaign or the CBA coalition, the community benefits coalition. Um, so yeah, I don't really know that I'm answering your question, but I am, I am really happy and have benefited so much from being a part of such a collaborative city that 
really doesn't silo itself um, from other, it, does, it doesn't feel like an industry town. Um, it's not like you either work in one thing or the other. It's like, instead you just work, work everywhere. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I, I think this will be our last question. Um, can you speak to any national projects that take on archiving cases like these? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I think we have two more questions. We may have one more after this um, that I missed, but second to last question. Um, are, have you, are you aware of any um, attempts to bridge potentially like different local databases into a larger database uh, or a nationwide network? Um, on the Chicago police, um, on the Chicago torture archive side, um, there's the National Wrongful Conviction Registry, um, which some of our profiles were pulled from. Um, and that is a good place to, if you're interested in like exoneration stories and, and history, that's a really good place to understand that profile, the Innocence Center um, we have we've partnered with in the past. Um, and there's a lot of like national reporting on exonerations. I think if you're talking about police data, um, what's tough, people ask all the time about like, can there be a, and I do think there are some efforts. I think um, we're just, somebody just emailed us today about like, oh, we're working on a, on a national through the police data initiative, I think is what it was called or the, yeah, something like that. Um, but it, what's really tough about it and why you don't see more of that is because every jurisdiction keeps its police data quite differently from the other. And so Chicago's data looks different from Urbana-Champaign's or looks different from Dallas or looks different from Pittsburgh. And not just in terms of quantity, though that's obviously a thing, but just in terms of like the literal categories of the types of data that they keep, what those categories mean, um, then the, the biggest barrier to why you don't, why it's quite difficult to compare police data his, like across jurisdictions is because there's no unique identifier for each officer. Badge numbers, as you can see on CPDP, badge numbers can change. You could use your dad's badge number because you're like, oh, I feel close to this number. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it makes it actually quite difficult. That's, that's a big part of our work and like a costly piece of it. Um, is that type of cleaning related to the earlier question about um cover-ups um how much of these kinds of cover-ups happen historically and or currently all the time like every day and i think torture cases are probably are not at the same pace right but we do know home and square is still open um we uh, if you don't know about home and square please look it up um, we, you know, the, I think a set of cases that we haven't made as much of a deal about, a deal about, um, organized as much about because there's not the same infrastructure, like the way that I was describing this, this constellation, uh, ecosystem working towards justice. There are victims of the war on drugs from public housing that don't receive nearly as much attention because there's not all the same types of ecosystem built around it. And that's no nobody's particular fault. It's just like a capacity thing um, that, uh, you know, code of silence is bas basically describes this phenomenon of like a drug ring that was going on and of, of like extortion and, and sale um, in public housing in the late 90s, early 2000s and before the high rises were torn down. And so many people were incarcerated um, because of those false arrests. Um, and since 2016, I think over 75 people have been exonerated um, because of that, that effort around the code of silence, the journalism from the Invisible Institute, but also from the Exoneration Project, but by Dr. Josh Tepfer. Um, and so I, I give this example all to say like, there is so much more than what we know about. And the only reason that we know about it is because there were enough people working for enough years. Um, but it, it's also important, separate from that, to, to know that like policing is not just bad because of like these, the worst awful deaths, right? Policing also is about like changing the way people can live and the type of freedom they have to be mobile, to learn, to, to explore. 
and the types of policing that students at the, the school where I'm a local school council member, Hyde Park Academy, the types of policing that those students face every day, just in their daily interactions and what they can and can't do, are very different from what kids at Whitney Young can, can do. Um, and so it's also just about the type of structural environment we create for people. So to that point, that is like a constant ongoing everyday thing that we don't even get misconduct data for. People aren't making complaints about you know, getting bullied by um, a police officer, which is a thing that happens, right? Um, maybe sometimes that happens, but usually it's, it, it's a pretty big threshold for somebody to cross when they make a complaint, when they file an app, when they sign an affidavit, which is very intimidating. Um, so you should assume always that there is way more than you know 